Hello, Avi. Hello. So we will start chronologically from childhood and before. Uh, okay. Uh, before childhood, uh, my parents are uh, Holocaust survivors. Uh, you know, they, uh, uh, most of their families, uh, they're both from Poland, most of their families were killed by the Nazis. Uh, they met here uh, <coughs> in the early 50s and uh, built a home in Haifa. Uh, they had three, three kids, three, three sons. I'm the oldest. Uh, uh, we all grew up in uh, NIM, which is a tiny neighborhood uh, by the beach, uh, in a blue-collar neighborhood. Uh, it's funny to say blue-collar neighborhood because it's something that you know as an adult. I mean, as a kid, you know that it's a paradise, you know, and uh, you, know, you, you just grew up on the beach. The only things I remember from childhood is uh, maybe till I was a teenager, it's just uh, being on the beach, swimming and playing soccer. I mean, that's... That's more or less how my life uh, passed by till I was about 15. That's uh, the main things I think I remember. We lived in a tiny apartment, uh, one bedroom where uh, me and my brother shared, and, uh, my, and my youngest slept in the in the whatever balcony there was there, and my parents slept in the living room. So it's a tiny thing, but again, I uh, yeah, I have only great memories from. Uh, from my childhood. Uh, I went to the elementary school there, uh, which was, uh, I assume, pretty rotten. At the, uh, <laughs> and then uh, high school, I went to the Ali High School in Haifa, which is supposedly a, a good school. The main thing I remember is that all the kids were rich except for me, so it was also weird. Um, and then, uh, you know, I went to the army and uh, then went to the Technion, where I uh, got my first introduction to uh, to computer science. I always loved math. My father uh, loved puzzles and uh, he always showed me things and uh, he was an electrical engineer and he, he always asked me riddles and uh, let me read books uh, in, uh, in Russian that uh, had riddles in them and uh, he taught me just enough vocabulary to figure out the puzzles and uh, uh, so I always loved math and I thought that's what I wanted to do but my parents thought that uh, maybe you know, I should get do something practical. So if you like, love math, learn computer science, I, we heard it, you know. <coughs> Maybe there'll be good jobs in it, and, uh, you know, it seems to be related. Uh, what kind of a uh, pupil were you in elementary school and then uh, in maybe in high school? I, yeah, I was a nerd. I was always a nerd, a uh, proud nerd. I, uh, loved, I just loved studying. I loved learning and... Uh, so in elementary school, it was not uh, perhaps the best environment, you know, it was a uh, sort of poor neighborhood. And uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the Reali High School, I, uh, you know, there were better teachers and I enjoyed learning more. Uh, it was weird, uh, yeah, coming from a sort of a poor neighborhood to this uh, really ritzy place where uh, kids started arriving with cars to school, you know. Uh, which is amazing if you think this uh, early 70s. Uh, but there were kids of, I don't know, discount uh, owners and stuff like that. Uh, it was weird, but uh, yeah, it, it just I looked at it as, uh, as uh, strange. It didn't bother me much. What bothered me much more is that I had to commute like an hour from uh, in two buses to school. But uh, uh, yeah, I generally enjoyed it. and. Uh, I had a, you know, I had a social circle of a few other, you know, kids from other parts of town. But uh, anyway, I enjoyed it. Uh, then I had, you know, I I went to the army, which uh, I was great. To, yeah. Sorry for interrupting. There's this legend that uh, either you or Noga Alon were not the best student in class. No, I mean uh, Noga Alon was in, a, you know, in a parallel class. We had four, uh, three sort of realistic, you know or scientific classes, uh, there were eight parallel classes, but uh, three of them were on more science math oriented direction. And uh, yeah, Noga uh, was in a parallel one, in fact, other kids that you may know, but uh, including his wife, Nurit. Um, uh, yeah, but there was, there was uh, no doubt that Noga was the best uh, student in the whole school, in the whole history of the school and the future of the school. He, uh, uh, 
Yeah, he got uh, he aced all classes, including gymnastics and uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I just remember. Uh, I mean, the main thing actually, if you, you know, think about high school, uh, we had uh, I think influence someone who influenced both Noga and me very much uh, in high school was a, a Russian teacher, someone who just uh, emigrated from the uh, from the Ukraine actually from Kiev and uh, came to teach us in uh, uh, 11th and 12th grade. And he came, he didn't even know Hebrew at the time. He la learned Hebrew with us and he taught us math. And uh, extremely passionate person, Kaplan, uh, passionate about teaching, passionate about math. Uh, I think we both were both inspired by his teaching method. And I think if we, if we, if we do something well or we, motivated to teach well, it's, it's a lot due to him. He taught us also extra credit courses in math, where very few people stay from all, uh, all classes. So I got to know Noga really in these classes because the regular classes were not there. Uh, so this is a very strong experience. I definitely you know, grew up as a, you know, or, or fell even more in love with the math. I mean, my father was really the first person to bring in me into math at a young age, but then Kaplan, you know, was a, you know, got me to understand much better it is to, to learn math and to appreciate math and do math because he taught it like it was taught in college. So we were already ready when we got to college uh, about college level math, about proofs. We knew proofs, we, uh, yeah, uh, and loved them. So yeah, actually getting to college, I told you that my parents thought I actually should do computer science, so I went to, Computer science, which with hindsight is uh, the great idea they, uh, they had because I could have fallen in love with any, any topic of mathematics, but uh, uh, being in the Technion in these early years, uh, <coughs> this is uh, the late 70s, um, in a phenomenal class with lots of, uh, with lots of people again that uh, populate uh, computer science departments uh, here in Israel and in the US, like David Peleg and all that Goldreich and uh, uh, Baruch Schieber and, uh, and many others, Hanoch Levy. We were all in the same class and, uh, uh, and then we started taking courses and uh, theoretical mathematical courses attracted me most and most of them, uh, those that were taught by Shimon Evan, who again was extremely passionate about the field, about algorithms and uh, it was clear to me that, uh, that that's what I want to do, or that's what I want to learn. I came from a very non-academic family. Uh, I think the notion that, uh, you know, that academia is a profession didn't occur to me till I finished college, when people actually, you know, these, these kids I mentioned, uh, my classmates and me, uh, were thinking about what to do, and uh, it seems that if you are smart, you should do a PhD whatever it means. And only then, you know, it's that, oh, okay, what's that? You go and learn more, which is great. Let's go and learn more. And uh, many of them, uh, you know, both our teachers suggested, and uh, that's what many of us did, say we have to apply to, to do it in the US. And uh, yeah, so we, uh, we applied in the, in the US. I applied to all great schools in the US. I uh, was rejected by most. I was accepted only in, uh, at Princeton and Yale, which at the time were not great in theory. There were uh, stronger places. So I asked uh, Shimon uh, which would I prefer, uh, Princeton and Yale. I said, you know, from a theory point of view, they are more or less the same. Uh, but Princeton is a nicer place. You know, <laughs> Yale in the middle of town. Princeton is so picturesque. Why don't you go to? So that's what I did. I went to Princeton and uh, yeah, I discovered research. This is something I was never familiar with. And uh, you know, it's, uh, I discovered that this is probably what I was meant to do, or this is what I would like to do if anybody let me, so just sit and think about problems. My uh, physics advisor was uh, Dick Lipton. And at least to my taste and temperament, and I don't know, uh, so it's not clear what is <laughs> where is the chicken and where is the egg exactly uh, there. But uh, he was a person, and is still a person, who's interested in everything, who la who changes research topic on a monthly basis. He was doing databases and privacy and uh, complexity and cryptography and VLSI design 
uh, all, you know, you're just changing his interests and I, I just followed him and I just tried to learn everything that uh, he was interested in and I found myself interested in lots of questions. I, I started talking to every, you know, classmate of mine uh, who did the uh, uh, you know, PhD at the same time in Princeton. There were too many of us, but and uh, yeah, I collaborated with maybe each and every one on their, uh, on whatever they were doing. So I would just say, yeah, I discovered that I just, I love talking to people. I love uh, this kind of problems that uh, our field was supplying. Uh, and I got to know my community at the time, which was another uh, great revelation, you know, introduced, being introduced to, you know, the field you are in. I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, I'm jumping maybe to a completely different topic, but uh, the theory of computation is not just a scientific uh, field. It's a social environment. And uh, this is, uh, <coughs> you know, it, it grew in a, to mature to understand the importance of it for me, but it's a, it's a society. And it's a phenomenal society of people. So, so people there are great scientists and great thinkers and great mathematicians, but they are just great people. And, uh, 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 great in the sense that you find that most of my friends are there, close friends. Uh, the field is extremely welcoming. I didn't know that. I, uh, I went to the first conference. It's 1980, fall of 1980. I was a young graduate student, first year. Uh, um, so Dick Lipton sent me there. He didn't come there even though he, I think he said he would and he would introduce me to people. But anyway, I'm a social guy. But there are other people. Uh, I knew they introduced me to uh, some senior people in the field, which you, you know, is the kind of thing that you, uh, you have your gods that you, you know, you learn this theorem, this, uh, you know, carp this, carp this, carp this, and then tarzan this, tarzan this, and then you meet these people. And you, well, first of all, you think they are dead already. <laughs> you meet them, they are young, you know, Bob Tarzan looks like a, a rock star with a big ponytail and looks like, uh, you know, dashing uh, guy and the uh, Dick Carp was supposedly, you know, you know, we created everything. Uh, and, you know, somebody introduced me to Dick Carp and, you know, this is Dick, this is Avi, you know, you try to think of other communities in uh, biology or physics where this would happen. And he says, hi, Avi, you know, uh, you know, where are you? And I'm Princeton, you know, what are you working on? And start telling him. I put some problem, it's going to be complete. He said, wow, that's really interesting. It's this whole positivity and, and uh, you know, uh, this amicable attitude and this lack of um, hierarchy and distance is, is something that I think uh, the field benefited so much for, from. Uh, and I think it was because of, you know, the leaders of the field were this kind of people. I think it propagated that. Uh, I, I believe that to this day the field is of this, uh, you know, of this type, and I think it's uh, when 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 you don't have these barriers, the the flow of information is much easier, and when you have social relations in all levels it's, uh, and friendships, it's it's of great value. And uh, this came up when I talked to Christos. Uh, I mean, I, I keep uh, you know being surprised and, uh, you know, uh, by, by things that happen or by, by the meaning of things that happened a decade earlier that other people discover. Uh, so, to me, suddenly it was not clear that uh, this is a great thing that is happening. It was clear to me that it's great in the sense that it's extremely lively and energetic and full of, you know, deep problems and interesting problems that I love. It's, you know, at the time it was mainly algorithms that were, uh, you know, understanding the power of algorithms, then understanding which problems are not solved by good algorithms, which, uh, you know, the lower bounds questions, and then the use of hard questions, which is cryptography. And uh, as I mentioned, Dick Lipton was interested in all of these things, and uh, in fact, in connections to math, which he always loved. So I, I grew to love math and connections of computational questions there. But to me, it was ne never clear, uh, or it became clearer and clearer with time, uh, how important the field is. But uh, I know that for other people who, uh, you know, maybe are more, uh, you know, who think more about these things, are more introspective or are more, um, 
more philosophical. Uh, I talked to Michael, Michael Rabin, for example, many times. He switched. He was a mathematician, a, you know, a famous mathematician, logician. He proved uh, he solved major open problems in mathematics, and he consciously switched to the theory of computation to complexity theory because he recognized that this is the next big thing, and he did it in the early 70s. He recognized that you know algorithms and then randomized algorithms and cryptography are you know. The computation basically is a great thing, but he, he's a generation ahead of me. He's 20 years older, and, uh, and uh, he was already an established mathematician. He made a conscious move. I was already there. I was just there. I never, you know, of course, theory of computation developed many different subdisciplines, and uh, one can choose uh, of where uh, where to focus. And uh, uh, again, I don't invest too much time in uh, you know, what will be the next big thing. Will the internet be the next big thing? Or uh, uh, I rather, you know, serendipity. I think there are enough uh, good problems. I mean, to me, the most fascinating problems, I talked about it before, is this, uh, this great challenge of uh, proving that some natural problems are difficult, something that we still don't know how to do. We know since Turing that uh, that some problems are impossible to do, to solve by computers. Uh, so we know that, but these are problems that, you know, it's not, uh, these problems are of not, no practical interest. There are problems of pra practical interest, um, problems in optimizations, problems in, uh, uh, you know, that underlies security, problems that underlie the next apps that we will build or the next industries that we will build in uh, whatever it is, coding or signal processing or, uh, anything else that we want to do, or maybe uh, problems arising in medicine and uh, biology and uh, economics or the study of the brain, all these problems that we are trying to solve them, but when we can't, the question is, why can't we? Why can't we? I mean, it's because we are stupid, or is it because they are just harder? You know, there is a limit to how efficiently we can solve them. This, to me, is the greatest challenge. But within this world of, uh, you know, theory of computation, understanding computation, uh, there's such a, an amazingly rich uh, array of problems that, uh, that uh, you can try to solve and are solvable, besides this very big challenge that's open, uh, that I let, you know, I let life determine for me which problems or classes of problems I, uh, I deal with. And uh, this, uh, deter, you know, let life determine. It's my students uh, or my colleagues. So, so, so after, I mean, so for example, if we continue the, the evolution after uh, my PhD, so a PhD was fantastic. In fact, I wanted to stay there forever and just talk to Dick Lipton. And when he told me after, uh, Two years, you know, maybe you should apply to a, a postdoc position. I, you know, I, I talked to Edna, uh, my wife, and uh, um, you know, I said, "Yeah, but why? Why should we leave Princeton?" That's you. <laughs> she was in graduate school also at Rutgers. Uh, she was uh, finishing her masters, and uh, we already had our first child, uh, Eyal, uh, was born there, and uh, we had just a great life from every point of view. I said, why should we leave? And we said, yeah, but we should grow up. And <laughs> so uh, I got an offer from Berkeley, from Dick Carp, to come do a postdoc with him. And uh, after visiting Berkeley, you know, just for a few days, uh, that was before the offer came, it came when I went on an interview, I knew that uh, uh, this was the place we really want to be in <laughs> after, after Princeton. It's, uh, you know, from this small, isolated, uh, beautiful place to move to a culturally diverse and uh, active and uh, rebellious uh, environment and just beautifully, you know. Also, we both grew up in Haifa. It both, uh, you know, it reminded us both of Haifa from, uh, yes, you know, just geographical, you know, a hill over the over the sea, and uh, uh, anyway, we moved, uh, we moved to Berkeley. In 82? Uh, in 83. 83, okay. In 83, and this turned out another fantastic move academically. 
We spent three years in, in Berkeley. Uh, in fact, it was two years in Berkeley and one year in the middle on, uh, in San Jose, in uh, IBM San Jose. This is even before the Almaden lab was, uh, was built. And, and I just, you know, it's just hard to describe the, you know, I mean, these three years were, were uh, I mean, like the PhD years, these next three years were absolutely fundamental for my development as a, as a scientist because the first thing was the first year I, I got to collaborate with Dick Krupp. And uh, yeah, this was phenomenal. I mean, how much, uh, you know, how much I learned. And uh, this was mainly problems in parallel computation. So I went into another field which I just started being interested in. I was uh, some work with Rudy Vishkin and then working with Dick Karp <coughs> when we had, we had Ali Apfel, uh, yeah, so the, and then and then the next year I moved to uh, to San Jose. Uh, we, we both moved and uh, Edna worked there also as a research scientist and uh, our, our second, our daughter was born there so it was a very enriching <laughs> family grew and it was great that way, but I, I met, uh, you know, uh, Mickey Aitai, and we worked on pseudo-randomness for lower bounds for the first time, and uh, uh, I met Ron Fagan there, and, uh, and uh, Stockmeyer, and uh, Nick Pippinger, and Maria Clave, I went with Nick Pippinger on networks, and uh, I met Cynthia Dwork, actually Cynthia Dwork, we, we collaborated even earlier with Nick Pippinger. Uh, these kinds of people were, you know, just at San Jose at the time. Was, I mean, Joe Halperin was there. It, it's just an amazing environment just to, to listen to talks. And uh, it's, it's not counting the visitors to this. Uh, <laughs> I remember a summer uh, where, I don't know, everybody was visiting. And just a summer in, in San Jose where uh, Gil Kalai and Mickey Benor and uh, Nati Lineal and uh, Ellen Borodin, all of them were summer visitors, and then we were all that's like me, postdocs there. And uh, we are sitting in a seminar where Nick Pippinger is teaching us, you know, is telling us something. And it's a beautiful lecture on something we didn't know, and we learn so much. And at the end of the talk, Ellen Borodin says, that's what I call consulting. <laughs> <laughs> So it was an amazing learning experience, and, and I, I branched out to, to so many different directions. And then we uh, thought of going back to Israel, the end of uh, 85, summer 85, and we already, after interviewing in Israel, we decided to go to the Hebrew University, and I also got a job there. And uh, Dick Karp called me to say that uh, uh, they are planning a year on computational complexity at MSRI. MSRI is this. Uh, Mathematical Institute at Berkeley, and uh, they planned a year there, and I can stay another year as a postdoc there. And uh, you know, going back to Berkeley, you know, was good, you know, uh, appealed to us very much <laughs> given our previous year at Berkeley. And uh, in fact, I should say that <laughs> the year in San Jose, we spent five days in San Jose and escaped. Immediately, <laughs> at the time, it was a cultural desert, and we had many friends in Berkeley. We spent all our weekends in Berkeley with friends and so on. Um, we went back to Berkeley, and it was another explosion of uh, scientific development because, uh, uh, first of all, in, 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 at that same year at the institute, where uh, uh, Lati Lovas for the year and uh, uh, Jack Edmonds. Uh, uh, many others, uh, the Carps have spent a lot of time there. Uh, I should say, I talked a lot with Manuel Blum, even though we never worked together at, uh, uh, at Berkeley. I talked to Mike Luby, uh, you know, to, but, but uh, that year in, uh, um, uh, in Berkeley, there were infinite number of visitors. So, uh, Odette Goldreich visited after we separated, uh, you know, we were undergrads together. We kept in touch socially, but uh, we met and suddenly I was brought back into, into crypto. Crypto was uh, the hottest thing of the mid 80s. And it was there that we collaborated on, uh, you know, zero knowledge and protocol design and all this uh, interactive proof business. And uh, Mike Sachs came to visit and uh, we collaborated on various uh, algorithms and... Uh, Can you say, I'm curious personally because yeah. of the crypto about the story, how it came about. Uh, 
your, your results with uh, Oded and Silvio? Yeah, so uh, Oded was a postdoc at MIT, so he was talking with Shafi and Silvio, and you know a lot of <laughs> what their work. And uh, he came to Berkeley to visit for two weeks, and he stayed with us uh, at home. It's sort of amazing uh, if you know Oded, because we had two small kids at the time, but I think maybe he was... <laughs> It's just, I, I, I don't remember much, but it's, I wish I remembered more how it, uh, how it went. But he, uh, you know, he uh, told me that, uh, you know, there's this great mystery. We just don't understand uh, what you can prove with zero knowledge. We have... Uh, uh, we can have you, can this, you explain uh, to the public what zero knowledge is? Yes. Uh, the past, the, yeah, uh, yeah, it's by far... Okay, it's, it's, uh, I'm going to describe by far my most favorite uh, 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 paper, it's with uh, Robert Goldreich and Silvio Michali, and it's about zero knowledge, so zero knowledge proofs, to be specific. Uh, here is the setup. Uh, you want to convince a friend that your opinion on a particular matter is the correct one, okay? And your friend doesn't trust you, wouldn't take your word for a, yeah, you have to convince him, you know, and, uh, or her. And, uh, you know, in any interactions of, let, let's say, uh, your opinion is correct, you know, let's say it is, uh, you know, right, it is, uh, you know, daylight and the sun is shining and you can bring arguments to this effect, right? but maybe it's more subtle than it's daylight now. And, uh, uh, or maybe we are sitting in a room and don't see whether it's sunlight out and so on. Uh, and in these situations, and anybody encountered uh, situations where you, you have an argument, you want to convince uh, the other side that you are right. Uh, the only way you can do it, even if you are correct, the only way you can do it is by giving information to the other side. By just giving data that's convincing. You know, there's no other way in which somebody will accept your view if they don't trust you unless you give them, you supply them with convincing evidence, namely with a proof. Uh, and zero knowledge proofs are proofs which are convincing. They are as convincing as normal proofs, normal convincing arguments, only they don't supply any other information. So it's this unbelievably paradoxical notion that was brought for cryptographic reasons, brought to the fore by, uh, in a paper of uh, Goldwasser, Michali, and Rakoff. They suggested that it would be extremely useful in cryptographic setting that one entity could, should convince the other, another entity, maybe they are competing entities, they don't trust each other, uh, about something, for example, about the fact that uh, yes, they generated their secret key in some cryptographic system the right way. Of course, the simplest way to convince is to, to reveal the secret key, but should reveal, remain, uh, remain secret. So, it is a natural setting where you really want to have zero knowledge proofs of something. I must say that to mathematicians, it's a, it's a revolutionary or paradoxical uh, notion for another reason. For mathematicians, proofs are not just means of uh, revealing correctness of a statement, they are all also means of understanding something. So, proof is valuable if you learn something from it, you learn something. So, the information in a proof is not, is, well, fir first and foremost is to, ver to check correctness of whatever mathematical statement it was. And secondly, is to learn from. In a zero knowledge proof, there is nothing to learn because no information is conveyed. So there is nothing to learn from a zero knowledge proof. In fact, that's the whole point of a zero knowledge proof. So the only question is, can a zero knowledge proof be convincing? At the time, well, the short answer, I can give that, the answer is yes. The result in, in this paper uh, of us, uh, with other than the Silvio, is that every statement that has a mathematical proof has also a mathematical zero knowledge proof. So everything you can prove, you can prove by interaction without revealing anything. Let me give you an example of a <coughs> situation where zero knowledge proofs uh, 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 could be useful in mathematics. Uh, there are stories in, uh, in mathematics where uh, 
Uh, well, so let's say the following imaginary situation, which I like to give uh, explain in lectures. Well, uh, there's this uh, you know young professor, and uh, she discovered the, a proof of the Riemann hypothesis. The Riemann hypothesis is the biggest problem in mathematics. Okay, so she uh, you know comes to the chairman, which happens to also be a, a number theorist, and says, uh, "Yeah, I can prove the Riemann hypothesis." And you know what? <laughs> you must be joking, you know. The, the, uh, I said, no, no, I can read it, for, but then, uh, you know, show me, you know, okay. Uh, so they go with a normal uh, interaction between mathematicians. Uh, you know, they will go to the board and uh, uh, says lemma and the proof of the lemma and this uh, follows the second lemma and, uh, you know, and after uh, two hours or, or uh, you know, <laughs> two weeks, you know, of this uh, very detailed mathematical elaboration, uh, the, the chairman says, uh, wow, you made it. You'll get tenure and you'll get a full professor. And, and uh, you know, that's a happy end story. That's uh, things that happen in mathematics all the time. That's how things happen. But there are some sad stories in the history of mathematics. They are not so common, but they happen. And they are uh, well-known cases where uh, the chairman, hearing this, uh, says, wow, that's great, sits down, quickly writes down a paper, famous number theory, submit to a journal, and the journal, of course, is amazing, and, uh, you know, publishes the paper as, uh, under the name of the chairman on this poor, you know, young professor, you know, doesn't get the credit. Now, what do you do to protect against this? If these things can happen, you don't, I'm not suggesting paranoia is, <laughs> is a good attitude in, in science, but you could imagine uh, that if she had a zero knowledge proof that, she, you know, of the Riemann hypothesis, they could go through this. Uh, and, and the chairman would be as convinced that she could prove the Riemann hypothesis and would be able to publish no paper because he got no information from the proof except that it is convincing. And I should stress that this conversion of a mathematical proof of the Riemann hypothesis to a zero knowledge proof of the Riemann hypothesis is efficient. So she could, knowing her proof, she could generate the other proof without effort, and instead maybe of talking two weeks, I'll talk for a month, uh, if we are optimistic, uh, and uh, go through that experiment, and, uh, uh, you know, there'll be a happy end, there's a guaranteed happy end, because the other side could not abuse uh, the proof that they just learned, the convincing proof. Uh, which convinces them of the right, uh, the right, of the truth of the assertion, let's say the Riemann hypothesis, without having any idea what the proof is. So how, let's go back to the yes. thread. So how did it come about? The so that, uh, you know, this was hot on his plate. He came uh, to Berkeley, and that was a problem that interested him, and we discussed it. And yeah, that's how, how it how came about. How yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they were, as, as you can imagine, in a, in a night. In the night. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, uh, you know, some ideas come in the night, yeah. And you were prepared for that idea? I don't know if I was prepared, but, you know, it came, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's one of these things that uh, you don't, uh, you don't exactly know. Um, some results in mathematics, computer science, I mean, this is uh, uh, math, uh, really depends on, on uh, point of view and, uh, and uh, presentation or, or ways of thinking that are aligned with you. I mean, I can see things that I, uh, you know, that others prove that maybe I could have proved, technically speaking, but, uh, you know, I, I probably wouldn't or I didn't because <laughs> there's somewhat different point of view. I can tell you about another favorite result of mine that, uh, 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 you know, in which this aspect came about. Uh, in the zero knowledge uh, proof, it came about, came about because somehow uh, we looked at uh, uh, the problem of proving that a graph is three colorable. It's just one, one, it's just one problem you can look at. It's just one statement you can look at. You don't look at, uh, proving in zero knowledge that the Riemann hypothesis is true, for which we, we, <laughs> we don't know, but proving that a given graph is three colorable. We understood that if we could do that, we, we really 
did everything else because we knew about MP completeness, all this connection. But, but somehow the combinatorial nature of that problem helped us develop a zero knowledge proof for it. With hindsight, it was not really necessary, but we didn't know it at the time. So it was. Yeah. But, uh, you needed also to assume a hard cryptographic hardness, which was different. Yes, yeah, so uh, in order for this uh, result, which I stated as unconditional <laughs> maybe, uh, I, uh, yeah, in order to have zero knowledge proofs for every mathematical statement, you really need to assume the axioms of cryptography, namely that they are one-way functions. So, uh, I, I didn't even say it because the world accepts this assumption as a matter of course. Everybody uses their credit cards on the internet. Everybody buys, on, everybody buys online. All these things. But in, uh, but in the 80s, it was not the case. So. No, no, in the 80s, it was not the case. But in the 80s, it was a cryptographic question. So we took for granted the, uh, the existence of a, of a hard function. In fact, it's clear that you know, if p equals np, there are no one-way functions. You might as well assume something hard. You know, if you want to say that you can, you know, let me put it like this. If p equals np, everything has a zero-knowledge proof because everybody can prove the theorems by themselves. So <laughs> there's no notion of information passing. So we knew that uh, this was essential. But I was uh, digressing to another um, aspect of this point of view. Um, uh, I mentioned that, uh, that um, you know, my passion, my, my single biggest passion is proving lower bounds or proving that natural problems are difficult. We don't know how to do it, but uh, we do what all mathemati math mathematicians do. We try to you know, uh, limit uh, the model of computation. We try to say that uh, uh, maybe <clears throat> we don't fight all algorithms. We would just want to say that restricted class of algorithms cannot solve a certain problem efficiently. Uh, so that's the kind of you know, results or developments in lower bound studies that uh, happened over the years. Uh, the way I got into this research topic is like every, almost everything else. I arrived to the Hebrew University, so that's a, maybe another uh, sort of personal digression before I, uh, I talk about... Uh, this result, I got to the Hebrew University from my postdoc, and uh, uh, it's another great place, another extremely rich uh, academically and also uh, populated by great people who I became great friends with, uh, uh, like Nati Linea and Michael Bernard and uh, Michael Rabin and uh, Gil Kalai, and a uh, uh, phenomenal place to be. Uh, I also discovered that, you know, this is a research department. There, there are all these graduate students who are looking for advisors. And uh, I just arrived and uh, several students uh, came and asked me whether I would advise them as uh, graduate students. And, uh, you know, I never done it before. It's a usual dilemma that we all face when we get to... And I said, yeah, I don't know what, what this is. Uh, you know, what, uh, what should I do? I, I asked other people and they uh, said, well, you know, uh, all these people who came to talk to you, <laughs> this is, uh, you know, uh, Maurizio Kaschmer and Yossi Gil, <laughs> uh, just uh, fantastic people. And you say, they were the greatest in their class. They were the, the phenomenal people. You, you must accept. You cannot say no to a student like this. I said, yes. And I started and I immediately had four graduate students. And uh, uh, yeah, so I asked, what, 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 what are you interested in? I have some problems. I work, what are you interested in? And Maurizio Kerstman said, I want to prove lower bounds. I want to prove that P is different than NP. I said, OK, let's do it. Now, proving lower bounds is proving that something is difficult to compute. Uh, proving that something is, uh, is difficult to compute is difficult. What does it mean? You want to rule out, you, want, you, you have some problem. Let's say uh, the problem of factoring integers. This is a problem. I give you a number, like <coughs> maybe, uh, I don't know, uh, which is a good number, nine, and you want to know it's three times three. You can uh, maybe think of uh, the number 1541, which happens to be 67 times 23. And uh, when you look at numbers that have several hundred digits, uh, it's a problem that we don't know how to solve much better than trying all possibilities. 
And it looks like uh, maybe a sad state of affairs, but actually the fact that this problem is probably hard is what currently underlies all security systems that we are using. But we just think that it is difficult. We just think that if we look at a, a number that is the most genius uh, uh, mathematicians in the world combined with all the technology and all the hardware and all the software of all the computers in the world combined, when they try to factor a small number, something with uh, 500 digits, will never finish. This algorithm, clever algorithm, will never finish before the sun will burn in 500 million years. This is the assumption. That's, that's uh, this is the assumption that underlies uh, you know, our security systems, our electronic commerce uh, uh, systems. This is just a belief. This is something that a graduate student or a high school student could refute tomorrow by coming up with a clever algorithm. So we believe this problem is hard, or some people believe it's hard. In fact, the world believes it's hard because it's implemented everywhere. Uh, uh, but we don't know that it is hard. So the task of proving hardness is ruling out all possible algorithms, all possible efficient algorithms for this problem. Again, I want to stress, it's possible that some high school student tomorrow will come up with a clever way, maybe using some little bit of number theory, to solve this problem, which has just 500 digits as input, to solve it in a second. It's possible. And then all security systems will become violated. Everybody could, could figure out, oh, you don't need to break into, you know, some database to, to get the passwords. All passwords will be instantly available. So you really want to, if, if you want your security systems to be secure, you would like a proof that this problem is out. But the sad state of affairs is that we don't know about any problem, that it's really hard. And really hard, I mean even just harder than this trivial, than some trivial solution which just reads the data and spits out the answer in a second. So the, this gap between a solution that comes in a second where as the non-existence of any solution that comes before the sun burns in 500 million years is a gap that we must, this is the greatest challenge of our field. Okay, so back to proving lower bounds. This challenge existed even if we limit algorithms. We just want to rule out some natural class of algorithms for a problem. And in the mid-80s, uh, Sasha Razborov, at the time a graduate student in, in uh, Moscow, uh, managed to prove a result of this nature, so some restricted low bound, some uh, not that P is different than NP, but that NP have problems that, that at least some class of algorithms called monotone algorithms cannot solve efficiently, require exponential time. Uh, and uh, we looked at a, a related problem and a related model. We wanted not uh, understanding time complexity or size complexity of circuits, we wanted to understand depth complexity. I'm not going to explain this, more related to solving problems in parallel, fast in parallel. And uh, we looked at the following problem. It's a problem of uh, uh, graph connectivity. Uh, it's a formal name. It's a, you know it as any, any navigator system or any navigator knows this problem. You want to get from A to B. You want to know whether there is a way to get from them, and if you do, maybe to find the shortest way between them. We wanted to show that, uh, so this has efficient algorithms, we knew that, and we want to say it cannot be solved very efficiently in parallel, in the same class of prob uh, functions, like uh, monotone functions. And, and we struggled with this for a year. And I should say, I mean, this, uh, I don't know what people think about when <laughs> they're thinking about research. Uh, yeah, maybe I should say something more general that uh, uh, yeah, I definitely, all my graduate students heard this from me. Uh, research, at least in this kind of fields, first of all, research is about problems whose solution you don't know. And you don't know the solution, and you also don't know when it will come about, or if it will come about. And most of the things you are doing is you are failing. Some people call it failure. I, can, I call it fun, but, uh, you know, so what I tell graduate students is that uh, if you don't like the attempts of solving problems, if you don't like the process 
of solving problems, whatever problems you like, you have to you know, be interested maybe in biology or in uh, uh, I don't know, philosophy, but uh, when you are doing research, uh, certainly in mathematics, if you don't enjoy the process uh, of trying to solve a problem, maybe it's not for you, because most of your life will be about trying to solve them, and uh, <coughs> the papers you'll publish will be about the few successes in this. Uh, but uh, really, the, the process is, is the way I find it. Uh, this is why I, I, think, I feel that uh, successful researchers are those who work in particular. I mean, you have talent and luck and all the other things, but you need to find the problems that are more attuned to you, that you really uh, care about, that, uh, you know, you, you love thinking about, you have some natural affinity too. Um, so uh, we were thinking about this for a year, about this problem of uh, proving the bounds for graph connectivity, and we just, you know, the hardest thing about uh, ruling out, you know, all possible classes of algorithms is, you know, just how do you do it? How do you, you, you prove that nothing of a certain type exists? You know, the universe is full of algorithms. How do you hold off? And, and uh, we, we came about something that we uh, liked very much and turns out to be very useful, is uh, viewing these fast parallel algorithms in a different way as communication protocols. And uh, the problem of uh, graph connectivity became a very different problem. It became a very you know, different looking problem. It became a problem about yeah, how do two people uh, figure out you know, each of them has a separate piece of data, figure out the property of this union of the two pieces of data. And what we discovered is that the number of bits these two players exchange in order to solve that particular problem is exactly the same as the depth of a monotone circuit solving graph, graph connectivity. Or actually, any, any computational problem can be translated to this framework. And once we, had this, once we started thinking about the problem in these terms, the translation, by the way, between the two types of models, even though they look very different, one is computational, one is information theoretic, uh, the translation between the two languages is very simple. You can teach it to undergrads in half an hour. Uh, but this new point of view, uh, you know, was really extremely fertile and it was just you you could just well, think differently and that led us eventually to a to a solution to a low bound which translated into a low bound graph connectivity and my point about this uh, viewpoint was that uh, later Mike Sipser who saw the proof uh, you know in fact other people just saw the proof and translated it immediately to the language of circuits. So you didn't need this detour of communication complexity. You could, with hindsight, with having the proof, you could just, because the translation is easy, just prove a lower bound on circuits and forget. And he asked, actually, why didn't you do it, uh, you know, why didn't you do it this way, or at least write the paper this way? I said, because we would never get there without this new viewpoint. And I think this, yeah, this new viewpoint was a very, you know, rich source of other, other things that, that happened later. So this is an example of something whose value I didn't understand. Uh, well, at the time, I understood its value in the context of proving lower bounds. This was uh, this translation to the communication model. But uh, that it will, yeah, become valuable in, uh, yeah, in, in many other ways is something I didn't, uh, I couldn't see at the time. And on the other so, hand, the proofs uh, so, in the 80s. Yeah, so the, the question of, uh, of uh, the value of zero-knowledge proofs uh, is, uh, is somewhat different. Okay, so already in the paper of Goldwasser, Mikhali, and Rakov, when they suggested the concept of zero-knowledge proofs, they had a notion that it will be extremely valuable because the place they were coming from is these situations, these adversarial situations, cryptographic situations, where uh, one party has, a, has a, uh, some secret information, the statement they are trying to convince the other party of is a statement that incorporates their secret, their secret value. So they cannot, they cannot and would not 
part with or reveal anything about their secret information, they, yet their statement depends on depends on this. So the statement can be uh, here is a number. I can factor it. It has exactly two prime factors. How did I build this number? It's very easy. I randomly picked two numbers, multiplied them, and gave it to you. So assuming it's hard, there's no way for you to know that it's a product of two primes. Maybe it's a product of three primes. Maybe it's a prime number. Uh, there's no way for you to know. And I would like to convince you uh, of this fact, but I want to keep my factors private because my, you know, all my private information depends on the fact that it's private. So they understood that having a zero knowledge proof of such a fact is, is extremely valuable for cryptographic protocols that by the time there were already various cryptographic protocols for other facts, for, uh, for other um, uh, applications like signing contracts and uh, jointly making randomized decisions and at the time playing poker over the internet. I think there, are, uh, there were various sort of seemingly impossible things that uh, were possible with cryptographic assumptions. We didn't understand their value at the time, but it was clear that having zero knowledge proof is useful. So our first paper together with the Goldreich and Mikali were, was uh, just understanding this. Just the most basic cryptographic assumption guarantees that every Everything that can be proved can be proved in zero knowledge. And understanding the power of this didn't take long. It took about three months. And uh, what grew on us is that uh, this ability is, uh, allows for a complete uh, uh, automation of taking any protocol in which security is breached all over the place, so any interaction between people with secret information in which, uh, in which uh, privacy is breached because they happen to reveal their secrets either on purpose or without purpose, any, any interaction like that can be turned using this device, this single device of zero knowledge proof, could turn into uh, a protocol which is secure against any, any adversarial behavior. So I should uh, step back and should say that NDR proved the result like that for two party interactions. Uh, so it proved that uh, any, anything that two players can achieve with, without privacy, regard, without regards to privacy, can be converted using cryptography to an interaction which protects them. So maybe contract side. Well, it was more about computing functions. Uh, and then, uh, you know, what we, what we uh, wanted to do and could do with the device of zero knowledge was extend this to interaction of any number of players. So here's an example. So I may have to describe what it means, what the cryptographic protocol means. So <clears throat> I like the... the even though it's not a very practical, uh, uh, a very practical uh, situation. I mean, those who want practical situation can think about voting. You know, maybe I should talk about voting. I want to talk about playing poker over the inter over over the telephone, but I can talk about voting. Here's the most basic example of uh, a situation where you want privacy, and there is an obvious protocol which bre breaches privacy, and the zero knowledge device uh, resurrects privacy. So, uh, voting. The country wants to vote on the, you know, maybe it's the US and they want to vote on the president, and uh, everybody just votes for one Democrat or Republican. Um, the way it works today is that everybody casts their vote, supposedly in a booth, you know, so nobody around them sees what they, they do. Their envelope eventually gets to some collection place. I mean, basically, there is a central agency which processes all these votes. And maybe they are shuffled and double uh, envelopes so that it, you wouldn't know who cast which particular vote. But uh, in some ways, it's a central collection agency 
process of them and say, oh, 60% for Democrat and 40% uh, for Republican. Of course, you know, there are no trusted entities. We don't, I don't trust any trusted entities. I have to live with them. I mean, that's a different story, but uh, you have to live with trust, and, uh, but they are not trusted. And uh, uh, the way anybody should think about it is, is that some people know what about your custom. Okay, but the important thing in describing this is that there is an ideal situation where there is a real trusted party. All the voters in the population give their votes to the trusted party who vouches not to reveal their privacy, counts them and tells, the, tells all of them together, listen, it's 60% Democrat and 40%. Uh, now, what happens in the real world? In the real world, maybe you have cryptography, so we have, we can assume we have this, uh, you know, one-way function or uh, factoring is difficult. We, have, we, we trust that some problem is computationally hard. This is not trusting, <laughs> this is a mathematical uh, type of trust. And we would like all of us, the whole population is going to vote to carry out exactly the same procedure, counting the votes in a way that will be totally blind to all of us while we are doing that. So what the combination of, uh, of this uh, multi-party computation idea of YA, which we extended to many players, and zero knowledge enables this. So let me describe what's happening in the, in the, in the real world and can happen automatically uh, with the new protocol. The trusted party disappears and all of us together are emulating the trusted party. So all of us have our vote. We just encrypt it in some way. I'm not going to describe how. And this generates some random looking number. We all put our random looking numbers on the table. They all, you know, I see a random number. I have no idea whether it means Democrat or Republican. Nobody has any idea. And then furthermore, we start processing this data. So all of us collaborate on, you know, adding them, multiplying them, doing this kind of normal arithmetic computation on this collection of data, while understanding nothing about the values that are coming out. So, so you know, we add, multiply, subtract, divide, blah, 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 blah. We all participate in this. And out comes another random number. And then we, all of us together, collaborate in interpreting that num random number because collectively we all knew our contribution. Again, it's complicated, but what can happen and does happen is we collectively interpret this number and says, it says, wow, you know, 60% Democrat, 40% Republican. So this possibility is enabled by by this combination of multi-party uh, computation and zero knowledge. So I want to explain just the part of zero knowledge. Where, where does it come about? The place it comes about is that in all that I described, I said we all collaborate. But you know, why should you collaborate? Say you want to screw up the system, you are an anarchist. The hell with everybody. <laughs> you know, everybody works very hard in casting votes, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I, I don't, I, yeah. So, when you are asked to add your part to multiplying two numbers, you throw some junk in. Throw some junk in, some junk will come out and it will, uh, you know, say 42, like in <laughs> the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. You say, you know, what will come out is you guys are morons and uh, rather than 60%, <laughs> this will be the interpretation. So, how do you protect against bad guys interfering? And in protecting that, so how do you make sure that some potentially bad guys, when they are asked to contribute their share to multiplying two numbers, they will not throw junk in. So you want to make sure that they do what they should. So you say, fine, let's they, let them prove that they did it correctly. Well, proving that they did it correctly depends on their private information. They don't want to part with their private information. But then, aha. They can do it in zero knowledge. So they lose nothing by proving that what they did is exactly what they should have. They lose no privacy. 
the rest of us are convinced that they did what they should. And thereby, everything that everybody contributes is exactly what they should have. And that's how you can turn not just this voting protocol, but any protocol with any security requirements into one that can be carried out by the players without having trusted parties. But anyway, a protocol in which privacy is not a requirement is so much easier. And what I'm saying is whenever something like this exists, you can take, take it and in fact automatically with a compiler, boost it up with this uh, multi-party and uh, zero knowledge ideas, boost it up to one in which the player themselves carry it out just by conversation. You, you never need cards or any envelopes, any physical implements, just conversation, numbers floating around, carry it out uh, and all the same privacy things guarantees. Everybody has five cards at a time. They can all decipher who won at the end even though it's just numbers and so on. Um, the thing about the, that I didn't realize and I would say that nobody realized uh, for, for probably 20 or 30 years is the practical value of zero knowledge. So, uh, one thing I stressed in my talk is that uh, the, the importance of theory is not just in explaining or building models to existing technologies or uh, data requirements or you know, social requirements. Uh, but theory is extremely important in generating new technologies and new applications and, uh, in fact, new requirements that can be handled. Cryptography is a great story in this respect. And uh, without pub you know, RSA and public key encryption and uh, these, uh, these works in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, there would be no reason to, to build the Internet. The Internet would never exist. As everybody knows, the internet was not created by governments. It was created by private entities who saw commercial potential for profit. And the only potential for profit could be that people could shop online without violating their secret information, like their credit card numbers. Without this commercial, commercial potential, there would be no internet. This commercial potential was developed when people like us in the mid-80s, played these games trying to, uh, you know, play poker over the internet. <laughs> over, sorry, over the telephone. This is, this is the kind of games that people in the mid-80s were playing with. These are the papers that were published in these conferences. These are, were the intellectual challenges at the time. There was no practical motivation. Maybe you can elaborate on it. Explain to the layperson how does anybody even get to think of something with no practical motivation. I think it's the easiest w thing in the world to uh, think about problems without practical motivation. I think that, well, mathematicians are the best examples, and in, uh, in this part we are playing the role of mathematicians. Uh, we are trying to understand something. Okay, we are trying to understand in this, uh, you know, in general we are trying to understand computation, we are trying to understand which problems are hard and which problems are easy. But then another uh, sort of, uh, as I mentioned before, another, uh, so you try to understand properties of, of computation or properties of functions that may be difficult. In this case, cryptography was trying to understand what do we do, what things can we do if we have hard problems of particular type, like, you know, factoring integers. And, uh, it was understood uh, that it can be used to uh, basically for protecting logins into computers. That was the origin in the 60s of uh, one-way functions. Uh, I can explain this. It's very simple where it, where it came about. It's uh, uh, how does a computer know that you are you? Well, I mean, you have your login and you have your password. That's what you enter there, what you tell the computer. Uh, so it has to compare it to something. Okay, so there, apparently there must be in the computer some big file in which it says uh, name Avi and password. Used to be a nut, my daughter's name, my first password, a nut. So it says, you know. But the password file is ridiculous because everybody, they realized in the 60s that everybody can break into a, 
And they said we shouldn't store the password itself. We should store, store some scrambled version of a not my password. But the scrambled version will be some function that's easy to compute. So uh, what you want really is that there will be some random junk that I can tell the computer and then they unscramble it and out come, yeah. Uh, or, or rather that, uh, you know, uh, I can convince the computer that I know my password. I can, uh, uh, what is written in the password file is not my real password, but something that can be deciphered to my password. So uh, this was the original way it was, uh, the original function of one-way functions. It was sort of, uh, you know, a very basic uh, uh, primitive. And uh, the understanding that it can be used for public key encryption, maybe I should say what public key encryption is in order to understand how people uh, hide their uh, secrets on the internet. Uh, the, same, the same assumption that, that factoring is difficult uh, uh, enables public key encryption, which means the following very basic simple thing. There are three people in, in a room. You know, you, me, and Christos, who was in the room just uh, an hour ago. And you and, I, and we just met for the first time, just now. We never met each other before. It's not like James Bond and his uh, M that, you know, they plan everything in advance and their secret code in advance. We just met now. And I want to tell you, I want to confide in you. I want to tell you some private secret of mine that I want to share only with you because I like you and I really don't want Christos to, to know. But how do I do this? We never talk to, any, none of us talk to everybody. So I want to convey secret information to you that a listener cannot understand. In other words, what I want to create with you is a secret language that you, only you and I will share and nobody else will listen will understand. But if you think about it, it's Patently impossible. What you hear, Christos hears. So you are in a symmetric situation. Everybody hears us. What one-way functions allow you to do, what is, uh, you know, the hardness of factoring, for example, allows you to do, is that any two people in this situation can create instantly a secret language between them that nobody else who is listening there can understand. And it sounds impossible, but in fact, everybody is doing it all the time. And they don't, they are just not conscious of it. Because when you first shop online, let's say with Amazon, you never met Amazon, Mr. Amazon or Miss Amazon, or whoever it is. You never met them, right? It's exactly the same situation. And all the people listening on the wire, and there are people, believe me, there are people listening on the wire all the time, they know, they hear all your conversations. So they are in the same situation and, as Amazon. And nevertheless, what does it mean that your credit card is secure when I pass it to you or to Amazon? It means that somehow Amazon and I, or Amazon and you, created without meeting before a secret language in the presence of everybody that enables you to communicate secretly, in particular exchange that credit card information. So this is the power. Uh, what I started saying before is that this, while well, this, you know, this particular implementation, application of cryptography became widespread and created the internet and all the applications of electronic commerce on it, and now the social application and everything else. <coughs> Zero knowledge was a complex protocol. It was built on top of this hardness of factoring, or RSA, but it was a complex protocol. And at the time, talking to my practical friends, you know, they are cryptographers who, who actually went and implemented things like Adi Shamir and uh, uh, talking to him, for example, uh, say, yeah, that's a great intellectual idea, a great intellectual discovery, and it's useless because the protocol is so complicated, it will never be implemented, just never. And I, as a copycat who trusts uh, <laughs> authorities, and in fact, that was, a, I would say, it's a widespread belief, uh, that is too complicated. And people, in fact, looked for alternatives, weaker versions of zero knowledge that may be implementable. For 30 years, uh, people believed this, you know, this functionality in cryptography will never be implemented. 
And I guess, uh, you know, despite uh, being a, an extreme optimist in my nature, there are people who are even more optimistic than me, like Eli Ben Sasson, who was my student, and, uh, and others, uh, who fought to make it practical. And I'm sort of amazed that today, and it's really recent, and it's really a consequence of uh, digital currencies and blockchain uh, uh, that are developing now, that the commercial need for practical zero knowledge, which in this case is actually a guarantee for anonymity, so you would like, right, being only, the fact that you own a dollar is just a, you know, a piece of information in a, in a blockchain and you need to prove your ownership by proving that you either generated it or got it from somebody else. Uh, you would like, you know, the, if the history of a dollar is something you don't want to reveal. In Bitcoin it is revealed. I mean, it's not really revealed, but it can be, can be obtained. You want anonymity and it turns out one way to get anonymity is form of zero knowledge, but zero knowledge, as we said, is in practice, so it's impossible. But turns out that if you work hard enough, uh, people who are both you know, excellent theoreticians and have a knack for practice and are working with the, uh, more practical people, today, zero knowledge is, is uh, the basis of many companies for internet currencies, for blockchains and uh, public ledgers and, uh, and so on. And I hear from my, this friends of mine, in fact, yeah, Eli Ben Sasson has a company, Shafi Goldwasser has a company, Silvio Mikali has a company. Uh, yes, and, uh, and all, all this, uh, you know, zero knowledge and multi-party computation base. So these things we believe are too complex to uh, be practical. Uh, became practical and they, they tell me that you go to a venture capitalist and zero knowledge became a household word. They, you know, they know what it is and they, <laughs> they know, not only know what it is, they will give you a hundred million dollars to start up if you are, of course. <laughs> you can prove that you know something about the business, but they will happily give you a hundred million dollars to do something with it. How do you feel uh, that it happened after 30 years? And Shafi, Silvio are involved, you are not? About the money? Not money, the notion <laughs> of not uh, having materialized, not even uh, in terms of money. I, I never cared about implementation, I care about uh, math. So uh, it's funny, I, uh, so I have three kids and my, uh, my older son tried to double a, a couple of things, a couple of times with the practical business. He's finishing a PhD in neurobiology, which you would probably uh, not do much with. He's uh, probably going to make wine, and uh, uh, as he's doing, uh, but he, he tried to double with the practical, uh, you know, having companies. He's also a climber, and he has uh, a company doing uh, altitude, uh, you, know, can, you know, if you hike in canyons in, uh, in the Judea desert and you are, you're, you're, what you're holding, the various uh, <laughs> ladders and uh, you know, uh, rocks and rom uh, ropes may have been installed by, by him. Yeah, so anyway, but he tried to, you know, he, tried to you know, he wanted to be rich, he still, was, still wants to be rich. And I keep telling him that uh, my father used to say, when my father, I mentioned, was a, an electrical engineer. And uh, at the time he was working for the Navy. Uh, uh, and uh, he had several offers from people who left uh, the Navy and uh, created companies. It was not called startups. They were probably, you know, <laughs> building, building generators or something. I don't know. Uh, and he said, it's not for me. I'll never make anything practical and I'll never get rich. And he calls it the Victor's on Cares, my son. <laughs> so, uh, so, but you know, who, who knows? Maybe he will succeed. I, uh, you know, I feel great that, uh, that they are having companies, that I, gr I feel great that they are having impact on the world. I feel great that these ideas, never mind them or somebody else, uh, have an impact on the world. I find it very natural. Again, I couldn't predict how natural it would by now, you know, by the last 20 years, uh, I, uh, you know, yeah, this is what I sell in my popular lectures like uh, the ones I gave uh, two days ago. It seems uh, that uh, computational complexity, uh, the understanding of computation is 
not just extremely intellectually rich, mathematically rich, and scientifically rich, but it's, uh, it's what's uh, you know, going to dominate practical applications of all, all, all types. I heard that uh, when I arrived and you were talking to Christos, <coughs> that you were talking about Moore's law. And I'm not sure what aspect of Moore's law you were talking about because I missed all of it. But I remember uh, uh, that uh, maybe 20, 25 years ago, I had an argument with someone about the value of theory versus technology in, in practical applications. And of course, technology is still developing and uh, many great things came out of the amazing technology that, uh, that was developed. And you know, one, one can mention will come out if quantum computers are built despite amazing technological hurdles. But uh, I said, and, and he mentioned, you know, Moore's law. Look, you know, for 30 years, I mean, by now it's for 30 years or even more uh, than it was uh, for 15 years, and it was already amazing. Uh, computer speed and computer memory or space for memory have been doubling every year and a half, just as Moore's predicted. Exponential growth in, in life, and you know, it's amazing. So we well, yeah, we'll continue. That's how. It, so what do you mean we'll continue? It's exponential growth. There is no exponential growth in our world. And in particular, everybody knows this, right? I mean, there'll never be, uh, a, 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 you know, an element on a chip smaller than an electron. That's a finite number, right? The speed of communication between two parts on a chip will never be bigger than the speed of light. These are hard limits. Maybe we'll hit them only in 10 years. At the time, it was maybe in 25 years. Maybe we'll hit them, you know. It doesn't matter when we'll hit them. At some point, we'll hit them. These are hard limits. These are physical limitations. And the only, really the only way in which we can have new applications is with new algorithmic ideas, with better efficiency to algorithms for problems we really want to solve. This determines only the efficiency of algorithms that we are generating, which are intellectual developments, not technological developments, that we will see new applications in our iPhones or whatever it will be implanted in our brains. It will not be technological. I mean, technology will always be there, but it will not, we will not going to double speed or memory or any, uh, you know, any, any of the hardware that uh, we are using. We will just be doubling are ways of using uh, yeah, algorithmic ideas. I uh, talked about uh, uh, interactive proofs, or at least proofs in which I convince you of uh, uh, in zero knowledge of some, some statement. Uh, uh, and you asked me about uh, PCPs. I want to say more generally that uh, one of the great contributions of our field to, to the intellectual sphere is a complete revision and extension of the notion of proof. Uh, it used to be that proof is something that I wrote in a paper and you later read and uh, checked correctness. Uh, uh, there was a big revolution in the 80s in creating many different notions of proofs, including the interactive proofs we talked about of Goldwasser, <coughs> Mikali, and Rakoff. Uh, and uh, uh, they seem to have been in the realm of cryptography. And part of the amazing interconnectivity of the field and uh, the richness that we, we came to uh, expect, actually, is that it connected to a different notion of, uh, of proof system, which is called uh, PCP and uh, a probabilistic checkable proof, uh, which are, uh, again, a different notion of proof that. Uh, was created in the, really in the 90s, uh, uh, that's extremely powerful for a, different, uh, for a different purpose. And I want to explain a little bit about what is this purpose and how this connection came about to really see how ideas jump about in uh, between fields uh, of uh, computational complexity uh, without, you know, <laughs> maybe without any reason or certainly without anybody expecting them and uh, how they feel back. And I want to tie it to the uh, uh, notion of zero knowledge. So a major 
problem we sought to understand as we talked about was proving hardness. We don't know how to prove that the problem is hard, but we have, a, like we have a, an anchor. We, we have our belief that P is different than NP and that NP complete problems. So a certain class of problems are probably hard. We feel pretty certain that these problems are hard. These problems are problems for which it seems that exhaustive search is the only way to, you know, is the only way to solve the problem. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. The only way to do it is probably go through all the pieces, strands of hay until you discover the needle. And if the size of your data, you know, is let's say all numbers of length a thousand, you have to, you have to find the code. Somebody picked a code for their safe, right? And the code is a thousand digit number. If you don't know anything, you know, you just need to try all of them. But all of them, you know, it's again, the sun will burn before we die. We understand problems of this type are NP-complete. They probably require exponential time, which for us is infinity. But even if we understand this, there are other problems that we really need to solve that are approximation problems that uh, well, maybe we don't need to find the right code. Maybe we, we just want to find something in the neighborhood that give us, a, you know, we don't want to make the maximum amount of money on the stock market. It's fine if we just make half as much as, uh, you know, the best guy, you know, the, or, you know, this most successful hedge fund manager. You know, being optimal is making more than the best hedge fund manager. We just want to do half as much. So that's an approximate. We, didn't, we never knew how to argue that, that uh, uh, these problems are hard, even assuming P is different than NP. And this came about very indirectly through this publicly checkable proof, proofs. I'm not going to tell you, well, let me roughly tell you what, tell you what they are and then say how they came about. What they are is the following. Again, I have a mathematical statement, the Rima hypothesis. I write a paper proving it, like the classical mathematical proof. And you have to refer it. Refer it. This is how science works, or mathematics work. This is how, that's the social life of mathematics. That's how uh, statements are verified by the community. So there is a referee who is just going to check the proof. That's a classical notion of proof. And everybody who's in the community and gets a paper to referee say, oh, no, I don't have time for this. And then you look, it's a 100-page paper full of details. Say, what do I do with this? Well, of course, it's, it's far, part of my social obligation. I will do it. It's also something I may learn from. That's another reason to do it. Maybe I'll give it to my graduate student to, <laughs> to do it. But that's a natural way. I mean, you have to check each and every statement, each of every line in these 100 pages because a bug, a potential bug, can hide anywhere. Here's the PCP proof, the idea at least. The PCP proof is a way for me to write a proof. I know how to prove it, so I know. But I write it in a way so that you as a referee don't have to read all the papers. You toss a few coins. You go to a few random pages. From each page, you pick up one symbol, the 17th character, the 27th character. You look at these five symbols, you, you compute something on them. If it checks, you say correct paper. Doesn't check, you say incorrect paper. Again, this looks like a useless thing. I mean, how can you find a bug smeared over, you know, a bug uh, hiding, you know, a needle in a haystack. A bug can be a needle in a haystack. How can you find it with just sampling it? A PCP, a publicity checkable proof, is, is a way to write proofs in which that if there was a bug in the original proof, after converting it to this version, the bug will be smeared all over. Again, it's something that looks like it shouldn't be there, should not exist, and the PCP theorem, uh, Aurora Safra and Aurora Lund, the Matuani, uh, Segedi and uh, Safra, Sudan. Uh, and Sudan, uh, says that it's possible. Whatever you can prove, you can build a publicly checkable proof on. So where did this come from? It's, a, it's another notion of proof. And at the time, we were studying interactive proofs. And the type of interactive proofs and the motivation for these interactive proofs, like zero knowledge, 
and protocol, this cryptographic protocol design had nothing to do with approximation, nothing to do with optimization, and nothing to do with this type of saving referees time of refereeing. Uh, what happened is roughly the following. As I mentioned, we proved that uh, <coughs> every statement that has a proof can be proved in zero knowledge via some interaction. And this, as you commented, requires some assumptions, it required the assumptions of cryptography, which we take for granted, but nevertheless, with the question we ask ourselves, what is necessary? Do we really need to assume that there are one-way functions? And actually, I studied this with Rafael Ostrovsky, and we proved that actually it is, it's equivalent. Having zero-knowledge zero proofs for non-trivial statements is equivalent to having one-way functions. So this is it. You can, that's its type. So now you ask the question, is it possible that in a, maybe in a different model, in, an, in another world where there, are interaction, there is interaction, we don't need this assumption? So this is something that I studied with Shafi Goldwasser and Joe Killian and uh, Michael Beno. And we are debating this and start trying to think of situations where we don't need this assumption, where we can prove zero knowledge proofs without any assumptions. And uh, in the model of interactive proof, there is a prover, the one who knows the proof, and there is this verifier that is, you want to convince. And Shafi says, uh, why don't we do two provers? Two provers? <laughs> uh, yeah, two provers. They try to convince the verifier. You know, they both know the proof. And like in the prisoner dilemma, like in the police story about the two robbers who were caught, you know, uh, but there's no evidence, so the police is interrogating them separately, trying to find whether uh, their story is consistent and so on. You can gain trust in these untrusted provers just by interrogating them separately. So maybe this situation is, uh, what kind of situation is this? When do you have, if you think of uh, going to the, to the, to withdraw money from the cash machine, you know, you, you usually put your cards and your secret, and you are the prover, you say, well, will, will I bring my twin with me? Will there be two, two cash machines that are not talking to each other and you are trying to con convince the bank that you are you? But that's a great intellectual challenge. She says this, we started working and we proved that actually in this setting, if you have two provers for the same proof, they can convince a verifier and actually convince in zero knowledge in every statement without any assumptions, information theoretically. So you don't need the assumption in this context. So, in fact, it's a, it's a funny true story that both MIT, where Shafi and Joe were at the time, and the Hebrew University, where Michael and I, Michael Benoit and I were at the time, tried to convince us to make a patent. Invest in a patent, patenting this idea of zero knowledge proofs with two provers. And Michael and I told the Hebrew University uh, this joke about going to the teller with the, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> okay. you know, it's useless, don't invest a penny in this. MIT actually then issued the patent by themselves and uh, nothing happened with it, of course, and it expired. But what's important is that uh, a, mo a new model of computation, interactive proofs with two provers or now with five provers or many provers was born. And then people studied this. So it was created in order to relieve zero knowledge of assumptions. But you know, and then you ask, you know, we have this uh, methodology. We have a computational model. We try, we ask, what can, it, what, what, can it, what can you do with it? What can you compute with it? What can you prove with it? And people started studying this. And it, it was amazing that the exact power it needed another story, which I will not tell, which is long, another development in another part of the world, uh, uh, how this came about. But people developed enough techniques to understand the power of interactive proofs with one power, with one prover, and interactive proofs with two provers. And it is interactive proofs with two provers that, because of this uh, understanding its power, it took the form of NP, <coughs> in, in a somewhat scaled version, but it took the form and people started relating it to proofs of this kind where they are written proofs 
but the verifier is just reading small parts of it. So this was understood as was a revelation, it was a, so that it, it's as powerful as, you know, that you can prove such statements with reading very few, uh, or you can check statements reading such uh, few bits. And now a, another thing happened, and people realized that using this, you can prove hardness of approximation. And with this too, it became like urgent to understand just how efficiently can you do this. And this is exactly what led to the PCP theorem, that you could do it with as few as three bits of a proof, no matter how long it is. And so it was very indirect. It requires the, the freedom to dream up models of computation that are completely unrealistic and study them despite that because it's natural and beautiful and uh, appealing and without any practical application in mind uh, that eventually led to this understanding of the power of approximation that was uh, celebrated here in the, in the PCP Fest. Yeah, let me just uh, say one more thing that's fascinating about this inter uh, connectivity and the PCP theorem. It's not just that the way it came about involved zero knowledge and cryptography, which are totally remote from the hardness of approximation, but that once we had the PCP theorem, so again, I, I described it as something that, uh, you know, saves referee times and something that is essential for the understanding of the complexity of approximation algorithms. But about five or ten years after it was done, a student at the time, Boaz Barak, realized that it fits back and solves a major open problem in the theory of zero knowledge. Uh, I'm not going to describe the problem, but it was something about the efficiency, the parallel efficiency of, uh, of zero knowledge. And it turns out that the way in which the uh, PCP, the probabilistic checkable proof, is used in the, his version of zero knowledge proof, uh, had to do with another fundamental issue in, uh, uh, in computer science, and this is the black box versus white box question. The question is when we are given a program doing something, can we understand something about it? Of course, we can feed it inputs and see what comes out. That's a black box. It might as well be lying in a black box and feed it an input and the outcome the output. Can we learn anything from the wiring or from the lines of code? And it's a basic fact. And in fact, the theorem of Turing from his original paper on uh, the Turing machine and com computation that you cannot. You cannot, in general, understand programs. You cannot understand what they are doing. It's uncomputable. But <coughs> you quantify this question, and the question, you know, you can, you can ask it in a more precise uh, way that I will not uh, explain. And uh, uh, when you understand it in this uh, quantitative uh, way, you understand that this is really the problem of, uh, you know, protecting data rights. You know, how, pe how do people that create programs, you know, make them useful to somebody else, allow them to be used, right? There's maybe programs for, I don't know, playing games or running music or, you know, sharing, you know, f uh, social things. But, you know, anyway, they developed uh, an algorithm which they want the world to use, so they manufacture it, but they want to make sure that nobody will copy it. Copy it in, so in order to copy it. I mean, if you co just copy it, it's, it's good, it's your own. How do you protect copyrights? It turns out that this is, uh, uh, you know, the question of understanding whether or what's the difficulty of gaining any information from a program that is more than just feeding inputs to it. The problem is called obfuscation. That's really what Bas Barak was initially interested in. And somehow PCPs, which again were created for completely different reasons, are essential for in the uh, in, in these applications. Institute, institute. <coughs> so uh, 
In my personal history, I described that after these uh, wonderful three years of postdocs in Berkeley, I, I arrived at the Hebrew University, which was another wonderful 15 years uh, uh, yeah, of just interacting with, with great colleagues and, uh, and great students, and, uh, and I had many. And uh, uh, I, I loved uh, yeah, basically all aspects of it. Uh, uh, that I got a phone call from uh, the director of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton uh, and uh, asking me if I would like to join their ranks. And uh, at the time there were no, and to this day I should say, there were no computer scientists at the Institute, so I said something about it. But uh, it was, a, you know, it was as a, one might say, really interesting. It offered uh, uh, a lot of possibilities. Uh, um, we had uh, our big kids uh, were towards the end of their high school. Uh, our uh, youngest was five years old. Uh, so it was a complex decision. Uh, we decided to, to give it uh, two years with, you know, consultation of uh, the whole family, well, at least the older kids. Uh, the oldest who was entering uh, 12 years said, you can go anywhere you like, I'm staying here. So he, he stayed, as we like to say, with the, with the apartment and the car and the credit card. And uh, as you can imagine, was very happy. Uh, our daughter was 14 when she was actually starting high school. She was actually happy to she had very fond memories from her early age of uh, Princess. She said, well, let's try it. And we decided to give it two years of trial. And the young one had uh, no vote at the time. Uh, although our kids get uh, voting rights, full voting rights, well, when, once they can, can talk. But anyway, I don't think he had strong opinions, let's say. Um, so that's what we tried to do. The short story is that our daughter came for two years, but after a month decided it was a big mistake and went back after these two years. So, <coughs> uh, Edna likes to say that in our, in our family, kids don't leave home. When they grow up, it's their parents that leave home. <laughs> uh, anyway, we moved to Princeton. So the Institute for Advanced Study uh, is a very unique place. Uh, people remember it uh, for its really golden times of uh, soon after it was created. It was created in, the, uh, in 1930 as a, as a research institute without students. Uh, it was created by uh, the visionary was Abraham Flexner, uh, who noticed that uh, in America, education was focused on undergrad education. While in Europe, you know, he, he admired these, uh, you know, centers of intellectual centers like Heidelberg and Göttingen and uh, places where quantum mechanics uh, came out and Hilbert and, you know, Einstein and lots of uh, scientific, mathematical and philosophical and cultural revol revolutions uh, and ideas uh, came out. So we need, uh, you know, this, um, Center for Independent Research that is completely devoid of practical applications. In fact, his book is uh, on the usefulness of useless knowledge, is uh, the icon of the, of the Institute. And uh, you can say lucky or unlucky, it's the tragedy of the Holocaust and the, and the Nazis that it was created at the time where uh, lots of Jews were escaping Europe. And, uh, some of them came as professors to the institute, like Einstein. Many came as refugees and were at the institute for a while till they found home, academic home in, in other academic institutions uh, uh, after the war. But many of them were just in, at the institute. Uh, it developed, uh, you know, it, it was determined to remain small always. Uh, at the beginning, it had two schools, just history and mathematics. And by now it has four schools. It's uh, uh, mathematics, natural sciences, which houses mainly physicists and one biologist. Uh, that's relatively recent. History, 
and social science. They are all together between 25 and 30 faculty members there. There are no students, so it's an entirely you know, postgraduate institution. In math and physics, it's mostly postdocs that come as visitors. In history and social science, it's more mostly people on sabbatical who come to maybe write their books or expand their research horizons. Altogether, there are about 200 people there. And I'm in the School of Mathematics, so we are eight. I'm the only computer scientist and uh, other you know, people doing various areas of mathematics. It was a very different uh, environment for me. Uh, in fact, I had to create it, so, uh, you, know, I, you know, it's a postdoctoral place, so I just, uh, you know, created a postdoctoral program, and uh, like in the school itself, also for uh, the theory of computation, complexity theory and algorithms, uh, you know, we really get applications from the, all the top people, and uh, we have a hard time every year rejecting many. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, what I've been running in the, in the last 20 years, so this uh, postdoctoral, postdoctoral program at the Institute. Of course, it was very important for the Institute from the beginning and very important for me is that we have nearby Princeton University that uh, you know, is very strong in uh, computer science in general and in uh, theory. theory. Um, in particular, so there is a lot of interaction with the faculty and the students there, both for me, for the postdocs, and uh, for our seminars and so on. Uh, so it's very different, and uh, yeah, but yeah, I tend to find <laughs> good things in there. <laughs> it's much more peaceful. I should say that when we left Jerusalem, it was the second intifada. Uh, buses were blowing up, restaurants were blowing up, and. Uh, our kids were just at the age where they were riding buses and sitting in cafes. And uh, I must say that at the time, at least, it was uh, this, cha <laughs> this change uh, to the very peaceful, serene, beautiful Princeton was, uh, yeah, positive. <laughs> One last thing before we finish. I'm just curious, because you're a great teacher and you love teaching, and uh, do you miss it in the institute? Uh, how do you fill the void? Yeah, so I, I, uh, I don't fill voids. I, my, my life is full constantly, uh, just full and rich, and I, I, I really, I never feel void. I tend not to uh, miss or regret or uh, being sorry for, uh, <laughs> and this is just, you're talking about work, there's of course life your family, your kids, and uh, other people's kids, and all this other, uh, yeah, but uh, uh, there's enough uh, that's interesting. Now, I should say, teaching is definitely something that I, I love doing, and, uh, and uh, I continue to do, but the form I do it at, I mean, I definitely, I mean, if, if I had to use the word miss, I like, you know, I love teaching, and I love talking to large crowds, so I continue doing that, not at the rate of, uh, you know, uh, uh, a weekly routine, but I, I uh, travel a lot, uh, I teach a lot in the, so I, I, I think myself as being teaching, but I teach at the, maybe at a slower rate, I, so I, I travel and give lectures, uh, and I found that uh, one thing that the Institute gives me time to do is to uh, do more of it, and do more of it on uh, uh, educational and popular lectures. So, as opposed to teaching uh, maybe technical material in, uh, in courses, uh, is uh, teaching stuff that uh, our field has been doing and, uh, um, you know, its value, these connections, and uh, uh, lots of aspects that we uh, did not talk about uh, are, uh, you know, are, you know, valued, you know, I, I would say that are interesting to lay person wherever they are, you know, just, uh, we talked about proofs, for example, which is one topic, uh, but uh, randomness, for example, which is another uh, topic I've been obsessed with uh, more or less all my, all my career and what it means and what its value is and what its value for computation is and uh, uh, is another topic and uh, there are, uh, uh, 
uh, notions like this that are extremely basic, not just to scientists, but to, to people in la at large, and uh, not just basic, are fascinating, are fascinating to people. Everybody, you know, everybody has thought about, I don't know, chance or luck or what role it plays in their life, or people have thought about free will. And uh, uh, these are things that I think that our field, the way it deals with it, brings a completely fresh element to the study of basic notions like this. And you, we have, of course, research results to back it up, and we, we have meaning of it, meanings of it that are practical and maybe implementable and certainly intellectually interesting, but there are also, you know, aspects of it that you can, you know, enlighten. So I, I teach in, you know, I teach, I, I talk in high schools, uh, yeah, I talk to popular audiences, I, uh, you know, I, so I, uh, I really enjoy this, uh, this aspect. And there are other aspects that, uh, you know, are just, just uh, different and I love them because I, I'm in, in the school of mathematics, so I interact more with mathematicians. And I, I, you know, I both learn a lot and I, I found much more value of different type in the computational aspect of, you know, doing mathematics in other areas. So these are extremely enriching. Thank you very much.